our next speaker, Kirsten Fiedler, is the Managing Director of IDRI, and IDRI is the Association of All um, Net Political NGOs in Europe, so making sure this goes out to all member organizations. Um, Kirsten is going to be speaking to us today about censoring the web and how that makes us less secure, um, the mantle of anti-terror measures. Please give her a warm welcome and a round of applause. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have to sort out the slides. I th think I broke the adapter. <laughs> okay. It's okay. Okay, uh, yeah, good morning again. Um, my name is Kirsten Fiedler. I work for EDRI uh, in Brussels. As Geraldine just said, we're uh, the umbrella organization for civil rights groups from across Europe, and we defend um, human rights in the digital age. Um, so today I have the uh, pleasure of talking to you about something rather uh, depressing, I'm afraid. Uh, that is to say, the most recent uh, anti-terrorism measures, how they are uh, censoring the web and how they are making us less secure. So this has really taken a lot of Edris time in the last um, months, and you will see why in the next 20 minutes. Um, so I think you could talk endlessly about uh, anti-terrorism measures, since states everywhere in Europe were super busy passing one after the other. Um, so I will concentrate today rather on the uh, what and the why uh, rather than the how and give you three main ingredients. And this is populism, opportunism and ideology. Uh, I will speak only very quickly about uh, how populism has driven the security agenda for the past 15 years. Then uh, I'll explain how the latest attacks were a brilliant opportunity to pass even more without uh, assessing the existing measures. And lastly, uh, I'm going to explain a bit more in detail the ideology, especially the ideology behind the um, uh, new anti-terrorism directive. And then at the end, uh, well, we'll see what we can do now. So how has populism driven the uh, security agenda since 9-11? Um, to understand this, you just need to look at the wave of measures um, a study from December 2013 counted over 230 counterterrorism measures since 9-11 only adopted by the EU, so at the EU level, not counting what happened in the member states. And this year is really just a tiny, tiny fraction of them. So why did the EU pass so many measures? So I think it's a big question, but the part of the answer is uh, out of sheer populism. Because after each attack, after 9-11, after Madrid, after London, and so on, every time there was a new wave of measures and never ever were the existing ones um, assessed for their efficiency. And since there's no real evidence for the efficiency, the only visible impact of this, these measures seem to be to demonstrate to the public that politicians are doing uh, something. And then um, we had the attacks in France, Belgium, and Denmark in 2015 and 2016. And this was an incredible opportunity to pass even more surveillance measures. Um, so I was at this anti-terrorism uh, event in the European Parliament last week, where the Belgian uh, Minister for Interior, uh, Jan Jambong, uh, quoted Churchill. And he really said, uh, never waste a good crisis. I'm not, I'm not kidding. So at the EU level, this was the occasion to fast track the surveillance of air passengers, uh, so the passenger name record directive. Uh, we had the uh, so-called EU Internet Forum. Uh, this was an informal project where the Commission sat together with Google, Facebook and Twitter to see how these companies can censor the web on a voluntary basis. Then we had the Europol regulation with uh, catastrophic oversight. 
And there was even the creation of a new commissioner job. Um, so we now have Sir Julian Kenning um, in charge of uh, security. And, but most importantly, uh, most, most importantly, they passed and fast-tracked the anti-terrorism directive that I will explain in more detail now. So, for over 15 years now, we have observed a big populist push to adopt even more uh, surveillance measures with the attacks of the past years. There was an opportunity to pass even more. And now, instead of evidence-based policy making, we have this proposal for a new directive whose contents are purely based on ideology. And this ideology is to collect more and more data, to find short-term measures instead of uh, finding efficient long-term solutions. And it is an ideology to control and monitor and to pass more repressive measures instead of considering uh, the social problems that are underlying. So, um, before diving into the nasty bits of the anti-terrorism directive, let's do a super short excursion uh, to remind you how the legislative process works in Brussels. So, in most cases, lawmaking starts with a public debate or an event. Uh, then, the political discussions in the institution start, and this can take the form of um, expert roundtables in the Commission, hearings in the European Parliament, or um, in most of the cases, the European Commission also launches a public consultation. Uh, then the Commission comes up with different policy options and starts writing a proposal internally, choosing one of the options. And then it publishes, publishes a legislative proposal together with an impact assessment. And this impact assessment usually explains why they chose that instrument, uh, it assesses the impact and the efficiency, and it assesses uh, what impact it has also on fundamental rights. So, the Commission proposes the text, and then parliamentarians and also the Council of the European Union suggest uh, modifications. Um, then, in most cases, in the final stages of lawmaking in Brussels, you have a process uh, that's called uh, trilogues. And they are called trilogues because the three institutions uh, start negotiating and agree then on a text and come to a decision. Um, this is very intransparent because uh, during trilogues you can't get access to the negotiating documents, uh, you don't know who proposes what, and sometimes there's completely new text on the table that has never been democratically approved by the parliament. And then at the very end, you have the implementation phase in the member states. And sometimes this process can take years. For example, um, the data protection reform took more than five years. The uh, net neutrality regulation that Thomas Loninger will talk about later today uh, took around um, two years. So let's have a look at the anti-terrorism directive. So we had the Paris attacks on 13th of November, uh, followed by almost no political debates in the, in the institutions. There was no public consultation by the Commission. And only two weeks later, in uh, beginning of December, the Commission uh, published a proposal for this directive. So either uh, the Commission wrote the text in two weeks, or um, what I find more likely, it had it already somewhere in a drawer. Uh, and also, uh, there was no impact assessment. Um, while the excuse was because of the attacks, because of terrorism, something needed to be adopted quickly. And what this means is that nobody has analyzed if the proposal, uh, if the measures would work, first of all, and nobody has checked if the measures undermine fundamental rights or not. Uh, you could also say the proposal is based on zero evidence. And apparently terrorism is taken so seriously by policymakers in the EU that beliefs seem to be sufficient and evidence is not needed. Uh, going back to the timeline, uh, only three months after the publication of the proposal by the Commission, the 28 member states had come to an agreement of their common position. Uh, it's also sometimes called the general approach. 
If you compare this to the data protection reform, it took the member states three and a half years to come to a general approach. So this means that on top of the complete lack of evidence to support the Commission proposal, the other two institutions are now adding more elements uh, when nobody has a clue if they would work or not. So apparently, um, no political debate is needed to identify really effective measures. And then, on top of this, the political environment is super toxic in Brussels. So this year is a press release um, by the conservative group in the parliament, just after the uh, Paris attacks. And it says that terrorists would happily vote left. And this was really super successful in the parliament, uh, because it intimidated parliamentarians from the center and from the left, to vote in favor of the measures or at least abstain. And some social democrats uh, really do not ever wish to be uh, in this position again and do not ever wish to be accused like this again. So the result of this was there were some surprising votes in favor, uh, which meant that the proposed text was mostly uh, modified to the worst by the European Parliament. So this means instead of a fact-based approach, the directive is being pushed through very quickly and emotions prevail uh, over evidence and arguments. So what's in this directive? Um, the main goal is to regulate terrorist offenses, of course, and the support for these activities. And this includes provisions on the financing of terrorist groups, uh, travel, training, uh, their radicalization, and uh, there are also quite a few uh, words on what to do in the online world. So, what's on the table with regard to cyber cyber? Um, the four most problematic areas are uh, firstly vague definitions, secondly blocking and censorship, thirdly uh, the weakening of encryption and the proposal to uh, uh, well, um, to intercept communications on a massive scale and uh, attacks against information systems. So, for instance, the text says that there is a growing misuse of the internet. And this is simply assumed. Uh, no figures are presented why uh, they think that this is the case. Then what the hell is indirect provocation? I don't know. Um, what is the radicalization of citizens? It, again, this is nowhere explained or defined. And then lastly, what is meant by, by uh, glorification and justification of terrorism? Again, there is no definition. And the fact that this is not defined is definitely going to have a nasty impact on freedom of expression. Uh, because this is already the case in France, where similar laws are in place. Uh, in France, the undefined glorification is in law, and this has recently led to the prosecution of a 16-year-old who pl published an ironic drawing on Facebook, and he clearly didn't fit the terrorist profile at all, uh, and still he was taken into custody. And only recently, a homeless guy was condemned to nine months prison, and what he did was uh, he was taken into hospital for alcohol poisoning, well, he was clearly super drunk, and then he started shouting around crazy stuff about going back to Syria. And he got nine months prison for this. And this is not the only case of where a homeless guy or person ended up in prison for, for glorification of um, terrorism. And even an eight-year-old was arrested by police on the basis of glorification and justification. Um, where nobody knows what this includes or not, and clearly the kid didn't know what he was saying. So, policymakers don't even try to write le a legislative text that makes sense. There are contradictions everywhere in the Anti Terrorism Directive, and a countless number of words are open to interpretation. So, the second problem is the addition of web blocking. The uh, European Parliament rapporteur, Ms. Solmeyer from the CSU, introduced this in recital 7 and 14. 
And firstly, it states that the suggested measures of the directive uh, should be without prejudice to voluntary action by internet industry. So this sort of wording, we have already seen it in ACTA, and it means that um, member states can encourage service provi providers to arbitrarily censor and monitor the networks. So basically, states hand over the responsibility to private actors. Facebook, Google, Twitter, and co are put in the position of uh, police, judge, and jury over our uh, freedom of expression online. And according to a number of expert bodies, uh, from the OSCE to the Council of Europe, this is clearly in breach of Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, and then it states that member states should take um, all necessary measures to uh, remove or block access. Uh, access to web pages. So you have to note that the text doesn't say they may do so. So this is more towards an obligation uh, to introduce web blocking. Um, and nobody ever explained why it should be necessary to do so. So this is again a purely ideologic uh, um, addition. It lacks any kind of evidence uh, that this measure might actually work. Uh, because we all know the problem with internet blocking is that you can have lots of col uh, collateral damage uh, because legitimate speech is taken down. Um, then throughout the entire text, there's no mention of a court order, which is highly problematic from the uh, rule of law point of view. And then lastly, of course, the content will remain there. It will remain available and it's no... It doesn't take a lot of uh, uh, knowledge to circumvent blocking. So the uh, suggested text uh, even goes against the Commission's own evidence because in at least two papers, the Commission itself called web blocking inefficient. Um, but the Commission doesn't seem to care that Council and Parliament are adding that sort of text to the directive. Instead, it's very likely that we'll soon get more online censorship across Europe and random restrictive actions by companies on this basis. So the third part is super worrying, um, and it's on encryption and interception of communications. And here, the text also remains super vague. And I think the fact that it's vague uh, is probably not a bug, but it's a feature because member states can then implement the text as they wish on the national level. In any case, so the text by the parliament suggests that uh, member states need to ensure the easy collection of undefined electronic evidence. And it's not ex explained at all what this means. There's no definition to be found in the entire text. But you get the feeling that this text is trying to make sure that law enforcement will be able to get access to communications by any means that they wish. And one way to do this is by uh, pushing for encryption backdoors. Um, sure, electronic evidence can mean anything, but if you put this in the context of other proposals that were on the table in the parliament, then it b becomes pretty clear. Here, the conservative um, parliamentarian in charge, Ms. Hohlmeier, also pointed out that anonymous communication tools like Tor, are a problem for law enforcement. Um, this part uh, didn't get through the Liebe vote, though. Um, it also becomes clear what it means if you look at the uh, recent German-French initiative. And it becomes clear that the intention is, uh, so has something to do with uh, encryption. If you look at this questionnaire that the council presidency has just distributed to the member states. So this means that in the name of security, governments are actively working on making their citizens less secure. But there's also good news um, about encryption backdoors, and that's that uh, the resistance in Brussels has become pretty big, um, also from other sectors like industry. Um, but the bad news is that they seem to move to alternatives. So, um, they want to allow the use of straight state Trojans and they want to allow the bulk interception of communications. So here the text suggests that law enforcement should have the possibility to use effective investigative tools. 
And again, this is kept very broad to allow the member states to do what they want. And then it goes on to say that law enforcement should include the interception of communications, electronic surveillance, and the taking of audio and audio recordings and visual images. So this is again not very detailed and leaves the law open to very, very extensive surveillance measures. So since the ideology is to collect uh, more and more data, there is no need to care about the right to privacy, no need to care about the principles that are the foundation of our democracies. The last problematic part of the directive is um, attacks against information systems. And Article 3 here of the uh, proposed directive lists all of the different offenses, and this includes, of course, attacks that cause death or injury to people, the use of nuclear um, or biological weapons and so on. But the Parliament Rapporteur, Ms. Holmeyer, also added attacks against information systems. And this means that interfering or even just accessing without prior authorization of an information system can be considered a terrorist offense. So any sort of security research also becomes punishable um, and, well, threatening to do so also becomes punishable. So if I say tonight uh, on Twitter, I am going to test the security of company X, then I will have committed a crime under this uh, directive. So the text makes unauthorized access to information systems a terrorist offense, and even if it is uh, to test the security of a company or for research reasons. And this then, of course, also penalizes the uh, responsible disclosure of vulnerabilities. So in sum, uh, the Council added surveillance and interception, the Parliament added web blocking and ag uh, attacks against information systems. And yes, where are we now? So um, unfortunately, we're super late in the process now because this th thing has been rushed through very quickly. Uh, the third trilogue discussions have just taken place on 28th of September, and we're getting closer and closer to a um, decision. So, um, it is possible that we are going to have a plenary vote in the Parliament in December, um, but this is only going to be a rubber stamping at that point. Um, and it's almost impossible to get any changes through now. And once the directive is adopted, Member States will need to pass legislation to implement the directive within two years. So the huge problem that we have is that the directive is being pushed super quickly, uh, too quickly to get proper attention of media, and it's possible that the press will only wake up once this thing has been adopted. And as I said, it's open to interpretation, so we'll get lots of fun during the implementation phase at the national level, uh, especially with web blocking. Um, but there's still uh, some things that can be done. Firstly, you can blog and tweet about it. Uh, you can phone Mrs. Holmeyer, uh, since she is still negotiating in the trilogues. And then, maybe more fruitful, you could contact all S&D people, all the social democrats in the parliament, especially uh, from Germany, and tell them I will not vote for you in the Bundestagswahlen if you are adopting this directive. Or you can also contact the representation of your member states in Brussels um, and your ministry. Um, yeah, so I think I ran over time, uh, sorry. Um, that's all, I hope I haven't depressed you too much, um, but yeah, I guess we can talk about this later if you want.